self-discipline. You know, one of the fruits of God's Spirit in Galatians, the fifth chapter, in Galatians 5. Because we have to realize that God expects us to exercise some discipline ourselves. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Galatians 5, verse 22, peace, long-suffering, gentleness or kindness, goodness, faith, humility, humility and the last one there is self-control. And really, that really is the real key to spiritual power because it really regulates everything else. If, if we don't have the self-control to do the things that God has called us to do, if we don't study, if we don't pray, if we don't have that discipline, uh, then we're not going to grow like we should. It tells us in Proverbs, the 25th chapter, Proverbs 25 and verse 28. <coughs> Proverbs 25 and verse 28. Excuse me, make, make that Proverbs uh, 16, verse 32. Proverbs 16, verse 32. I had a wrong scriptural reference here. But it says, He that is slow to anger is, is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that, that taketh a city. So we need to realize that, that being able to rule our spirit is a great, great spiritual asset that God has given us. It tells us again in Proverbs 25, excuse me, Proverbs 25 and verse 28. Proverbs 25, 28. He that has no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. And you realize, of course, back in the days of the Israel, when Israel was uh, in Palestine, Back in those days, I mean, you just didn't live out in the country like we do today. You know, you go out towards Edgewood and Moriarty, people live out there in the country and, and uh, you know, these, these ranches and farms out there. You just didn't do that back in those days. You had to live within the protection of city walls. And usually people would go out, they would farm or ranch during the day, but they would come back at night to the protection within the city. In a city that didn't have walls because all the marauders and, and the, uh, 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 Vigilantes, every, every, all these other evil people that, that wandered out there that, the, uh, that would rob, a steal, and plunder. If you didn't have a city surrounded for walls, by walls, you were very vulnerable. So Solomon is saying, I mean, if, if we're like that, if we don't have if any control over our spirit, we're just like that city. And, and we're encouraged to exercise self-discipline. You know, Joseph's life was an example of that. We're told in 1 Corinthians, the 6th, 8th, 6th chapter, verse 18, to flee fornication. Flee fornication. And so we have a responsibility not to become involved with situations that, that may not be that, that great. I remember years ago, I, a man was at work, and this lady wanted to... Wanted to uh, get him to go in this dark storage room with her and uh, you know he realized this woman with her character that he should not be in there by himself with her alone and he had to flee that situation we get into situations in our life that we have to make some choices and one of the most tremendous spiritual principles we can realize right away is it's always a lot easier it, when we let these things come into our minds, when we dwell on them, I mean, we're, we're really weakened. The time to resist is before, in other words, when the temptation appears at the gates of our mind, not to let our minds let, dwell on those type of things or accept those type of wrong thoughts. Some people can be guilty of uh, allowing bitterness or discouragement or worry to come into their minds and they'll start dwelling and it starts festering and it just gets worse and worse and worse. We have to resist that. We have to resist that. I, I remember years ago, 
I told a lady who was having a lot of discouragement and, and I felt like a lot of fiery darts from Satan questioned her salvation and she was getting very discouraged and desperate and I, and I told her, I said, one of the great secrets is just simply telling yourself, I, I, no, I won't allow my mind to go there. I'm not going there mentally. If there's something in your life, when you start thinking about it, it brings you down, discourages you, gets you in the wrong frame of mind, don't go there mentally. In other words, close your spiritual gates. Don't allow that into your mind. And if you can remember there, I, that I've heard people tell me that they remembered that about don't go there. And that can be a very, very big help to you. Being able to resist wrong thoughts. Do what you can to, to protect yourself. And the real problem we have, and I think James makes that very clear, is, is in the dwelling. Allowing, it's just like that leaven that, that we are not supposed to ingest during the days of unleavened bread, it's, it, the way these little uh, cells of, of yeast work, the way they leaven bread is they, they, <laughs> they grow very rapidly, they pr pr proliferate very rapidly. They bed themselves in the dough. As they breathe, they emit carbon dioxide. Those little, that carbon dioxide begins to, to uh, swell up the bread, those little, uh, the gas of the carbon dioxide. And as they do that, they begin to multiply and to grow. And the little, little yeast cells, they break, break off into colonies, and they break off into other colonies. And pretty soon, you've got this, this, this uh, loaf that's leavened with yeast. But it's the same way with sin. That, that, you know, when we allow these things in our mind and our minds to dwell on it, uh, that's when Satan really gets the advantage of us. We're much stronger before we allow that process to take place. We have to resist. To resist and not allow those things to come into our mind. You know, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verse 25, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 25, and every man that strives for the mastery is temperate, or he's actually self-controlled in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. And I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, or so fight I, not as one that, that beats the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. And so we need to realize that we have a responsibility ourselves. We have things to do for ourselves, and, and, and we have to exercise uh, that resistance. It's amazing even what an individual uh, without God's Spirit is able to do, just with self-discipline. How much more can we do with the Spirit of God, you know, helping us? It tells us in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3, 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You know, just like an army would try to, to build up a bulwark against the wall of a city and, and to, to bring it down, the Satan and the devil will try to, to come up against our minds and begin to, to get himself uh, built up against our minds to overcome and, throw, and, and overthrow us. And it says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And so we have a responsibility. We can say no. We have to do what we can to, to overcome and to resist. And we can do that. We have to resist. You know, Benjamin Franklin said one time, he said, you know, if your head is made of wax, don't walk in the sun. <laughs> if you have a particular problem, then you shouldn't put yourself in the position to be dominated by it. You know, Paul told us, he made a very striking comment about uh, making no provision for the flesh making no provision for the flesh. And sometimes, you know, we can do that. We can deceive ourselves and we can make provision. I remember a man that was trying to overcome smoking and he had his little cigarettes in a little plastic bag. And we, and we can 
put ourselves in situations where we're going to allow ourselves provision. You know, a person who might have a problem with alcoholism, you know, has, a, uh, I remember years ago, my, my dad was trying to overcome alcoholism, and, and he, he hid a gallon of rum underneath the house, way back where he couldn't get to it, you see. But then one day I heard a bunch of noise, and here comes my dad crawling out of the house with that, that bottle of rum. He had made provision. We can't do that. Sometimes we make provision, you know, in another way. As we somehow think it's not that bad or not, or not that, or not that something. It's kind of cute. I remember they had a, they had a, uh, a minister, I don't know if he's still on or not, years ago. He was, I think, I believe he was a Sabbath keeper. His name is Dr. Scott. But he would sit there and he would cuss and he had a big cigar hanging out of his mouth. And he somehow, you know, he thought it was cute. He thought it was cute. He thought it was kind of, you know, he, he had a persona he wanted to put on, so he would cuss some, and then he would have the cigar hanging in his mouth. But see, he was making provisions for certain attributes because, you know, that made it okay. But Paul, Paul does tell us in Romans 13, verse 14, put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 13, and verse 14. And make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And not to kid ourselves that some of the problems and difficulties we have are wrong. And we need to resist and we need to get them out of our life. And we can with the help of God. The fourth rule, it really overlaps with the first, fourth one, is rely. Rely. Ultimately, we must rely upon Jesus Christ in faith. That is a big key. And of course that overlaps with prayer because one of the ways we certainly receive help from God is through prayer. It tells us in Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse 13. Philippians 4, verse 13, where Christ tells us, I can do all things through Christ, or actually the original Greek is in Christ, who strengthens me. I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. It tells us in Psalms 18 chapter. Psalms 18. In verse 32. Where he says, It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my ways perfect. And so we have to realize where our help comes from. I remember the story of a, a little boy in his backyard, and his, his dad had sent him out there to, to pick up a log. And he was back there, and he couldn't get the log picked up, and his dad came out, came out and said, how's it going, son? And he said, Dad, I, I, can't, I, I can't do it. I'm using all my strength, and I can't lift it. He says, no, you're not using all your strength because you haven't asked me to help you yet. So he went out, and he helped his dad and to help the son lift up that, that log. And so we need to realize where our help comes from, where our strength comes from, that we have to have God. God's there to help us. We have to rely upon him. I, I mentioned the Passover, about this tremendous liberty that we have in Christ that is mentioned in Hebrews, the fourth chapter. And I want to, I want to mention it again because I think it's paramount. I think it's something certainly that we have to grow in. 